Good evening, and welcome to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. I'm Tina Olson, the director of the University of Michigan's Museum of Art. We're pleased to be partners on today's events, presenting an abstract, abstract painter, Cullen Washington, Jr., in advance of his exhibition, The Public Square, which opens at UMA this Saturday. My remarks tonight are focused on three topics. I'm going to thank the people who made tonight's talk and the exhibition possible. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Cullen Washington and the exhibition. And then I'm going to introduce Vice Provost for Equity, Inclusion, and Chief Diversity Officer Robert Sellers, who will then tell you more about this year's Martin Luther King Symposium, which tonight's talk is a part of. A couple of housekeeping items first. Please remember to silence your cell phones. Do that now if you haven't. And we will have a regular Q&A today in the screening room directly following this main stage presentation. Please join us there. Exit the theater, go left in the lobby, down the long hallway, and you'll reach another lobby and the entrance to the screening room. There are a few people who are very important to thank tonight. I'm deeply grateful to Vera Grant, the curator of the exhibition at the museum, who's in the audience tonight, for her fantastic and important work to bring this exhibition to life. I also want to thank the funders of the exhibition. Lead support is provided by Erica and Ted Papendick, Candy and Michael Barash, the University of Michigan's Office of the Provost, Michigan Medicine, the Michigan Council for the Arts and Cultural Affairs, and the Institute for the Humanities. Additional generous support is provided by the University of Michigan Department of the History of Art, the School of Education, the Department of Afro-American and Afri African Studies, the School of Social Work, and the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. Now I'd like to tell you a bit more about the exhibition, Cullen Washington, Jr., The Public Square. The show is Cullen Washington's first solo show in the United States. It consists of a vivid series of large-scale abstract paintings and small collage works that survey his interest in humanity and the agora, the ancient Greek public square. In ancient Athens, the agora served as the spiritual, commercial, and political center for Greek life. Although its contemporary meaning refers often to the marketplace, agora originally meant to speak in the assembly. In a time of global tension in politics, immigration, and social polarization, Mr. Washington says he chooses the forum of the public square as a key site for democracy, humanity, and freedom of speech. An artist residency in Athens allowed him to visit ancient Greek sites, including the Agora. Despite the aftermath of economic turmoil, he said he witnessed globalization at its best in Athens, affirming his idea of the global citizen and the power of public speech. Cullen Washington is interested in creating work that reflects the greatest common denominator, mind, feelings, and soul. The common factors that are present in all people and, ref and reflect powerful possibilities for unity. His work seeks to exemplify the equality and diversity in people. The installation at the museum is designed with an actual public square at its center, complete with sound components featuring samplings from a range of speeches, including the, work, the words of Kofi Annan, Maya Angelou, James Baldwin, John F. Kennedy, and Barack Obama. Colin Washington is a native of Alexandria, Louisiana, and he lives and works in New York City. His work is in the collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and the Alexandria Museum of Art. He has shown nationally and internationally at the Contemporary Art Museum in Houston, the Queens Museum, New York, and the Saatchi Gallery in London. He's been an artist in residence at the Studio Museum in Harlem, Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture, Yadu, and the Joan Mitchell Foundation Residency in New Orleans. He's a recipient of a Joan Mitchell Foundation grant. Washington has taught at, Pratt, at the Pratt Institute, at Amherst College, Hunter College, and the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. He's lectured broadly, including at the Athens School of Fine Arts in Greece, at Parsons in New York, Rhode Island School of Design, Brandeis, and the Tyler School of Art at Temple. 
Cullen Washington's talk tonight is also presented on the, um, under the umbrella of the annual U University of Michigan Symposium honoring the work and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to advance justice and equality for all the world's citizens. I'm very excited and honored to have Vice Provost for Equity Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer Robert Sellers with us tonight to say a few words about the symposium and to join me in welcoming Cullen Washington to the stage. Good evening, everyone. Oh, no, 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 no. Come on now. We are about to uh, have a feast of the soul, so let's get ready for it. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you. I want to thank uh, UMMA and Stamp School of Art and Design for inviting me to be here this evening. Uh, it's amazing to me, each and every year, the amount of energy that is generated by the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Symposium. This campus is one of the uh, most impactful and most um, busy campuses with regards to celebrating uh, the Martin Luther King Jr.'s life and legacy. We have over 45 different events organized all across campus over the next few weeks and within the next month. I invite you all to attend as many of those as you possibly can. The theme of this year's symposium is the miseducation of us. And in this case, the us in the symposium theme really has a double meaning. In part, the us represents the United States, but it also represents literally us. It underscores the need to pay attention to the content and form of our formal schooling, as well as the broader ways in which we are socialized. We need to ask ourselves, what messages have our schools and other institutions given us that shape the way we understand, appreciate, and relate to not only one another, but also to the land? The literal us is a reminder that each of us must take account of how we are the products of our school systems as well as the American socialization. It also calls us to remember that while we are the products of our upbringing and participants in our environment, neither background, history, nor surroundings are the full determinant of our destiny. To acknowledge our miseducation put us on a path to unlearn as well as learn anew so that we may create a nation and a society that is equitable and just for all. For example, when we reduce Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and all that he has done and all that he stood for to just a couple of lines in the I Have a Dream speech, we contribute to a miseducation about who Dr. King was. We miss out on his radical calls to remake society through the redistribution of economic as well as political power. Programs like this one tonight provides us with a new and deeper way of understanding the impact of social justice warriors like Dr. King and the work that is still yet to be done. It offers new possibilities for how we might structure our society to better honor our own shared humanity. I would like to thank University of Michigan Museum of Arts for presenting this important exhibition of Cullen Washington Jr.'s work. I know that I'm personally looking forward to seeing it I hope that all of you will take the time to visit UMMA and to visit it again. The show opens this Saturday. There will be many events and programs during the winter term 
and many opportunities for you to visit. So please visit umma.umich.edu for more information about these events. Now, it is my great pleasure and great honor to invite to the stage Mr. Colin Washington, Jr., our speaker tonight. Thank you. can't see anything but light. <laughs> I guess that's a good thing. Just want to say thank you for coming out to hear me share my thoughts and images of the work that I've labored for just about all my life. Many people ask, how long does it take to do a painting? It's uh, all my life. Uh, may not be the answer you like to hear, but it's not romantic. It takes years and years to get to know yourself, and it takes years and years to be your best self. I want to thank the University of Michigan for giving me this opportunity. This is a huge opportunity for me. I want to thank all of you for coming, friends and loved ones. Specifically, I want to thank the curator for this uh, for the exhibition that I hope you get a chance to see Saturday, Vera Grant for recognizing my spark and giving me this opportunity. So before I begin with the good stuff, with the images, right, with the dessert, I'm gonna give you a little bit of vegetables. <laughs> I used to hate to eat vegetables. Um, and basically these are meditations that I have in the morning about the grid and humanity and just about my role as an artist in, in, in this time and age. As an artist, I ask myself, what challenge does painting address? How do we translate abstract ways of thinking into practical means for everyday life? What does the grid have anything to do with preventing violence against black citizens and women and immigrant children. In layman's terms, the grid can be understood as a technological network that supplies information, energy, and some would say social connection. In art historical terms, the grid is a device that flattens space and suspends time. In the book, The Originality of the Avant-Garde and Other Modernist Myths by Rosalind Krauss, she describes the grid as the flattening of the narrative. No beginning, no middle or end. No prelude, climax or epilogue. It is seen as a whole with no linear sequence. For me, physically and aesthetically, the grid is the compositional device which I resolve visual problems. The grid has no place of origin. It is a lateral infrastructure that allows for, allows for the infinite continuity. Compositionally, I know that within its context, I can fluidly hinge any mark on an axis and be confident in its relation to other future contingent marks. The grid can be warped, organic, or rigid in its format and will still function because of its connectedness. Because of the grid's lateral nature, it allows me a sense of flexibility. Depending on my choice of scale, the modular aspects of the creative process can be constrained or expanded. But here I offer a different understanding of the grid. The grid is intergenetic, interracial, international intergender, interconnected, interrelational, and interdependent. The grid is transcendent of political personifications, no blackness, no whiteness, nor immigrant. The grid is the infinite field of activity where the lives of things and people intersect with mutual exchange. 
The grid is where the idea of the whole can be met with the reality of the individual. The grid is a metaphor for individual parts acting in harmonious, kinetic flux with each individual's needs being met in accordance to the whole. It would seem that individual interest would be in direct opposition to the whole, but the wisdom of the grid strikes a balance. It allows for non-hierarchical views of humanity. It resolves the problem of identity and difference by placing diverse component parts on one plane while still maintaining the integrity of each one. In this concept of identity, people are accepted exactly as they are. Identity is opaque. If seen laterally with no origin as with the grid, people and cultures are intermixed, exchanging traits and qualities among one another, none being better than the rest. Everyone sitting at the same table offering their own dish at potluck. In this fight for equality, the grid is justice. It wins by unanimous decision. It is unified anonymity, the unarmed and unlisted together. Martin Luther King wrote in his letter from the Birmingham jail, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly, end quote. Literally all things are connected. After all, are we all made of stardust? Everything is relative and is relative. All things connected in constant exchange. This is love. The grid is love. Love is exchange, giving and receiving. A pooling of resources, harmony, the interchange. With the grid, movement changes from a longitudinal vertical to a latitudinal horizontal exchange. A free flow of information, works, words, thoughts, feelings, and emotions. With the grid, there are no hierarchies. With hierarchies, there is a focus on errors, smarter, richer, prettier, better, etc. With the grid, there is difference, but difference is equal. There is justice with the grid. There are no closed systems. The grid is set up on mutual relevance and reference. Separate is unequal, but difference is. In this case, identity can be problematic in that it inherently separates them, us, us against them, othering. And Raoul Hilberg's The Destruction of the European Jews, 1961, Hilberg details the four points in the process of destruction. Number one, the identification of a group as inhuman. Number two, the disenfranchisement or ostracizing of the group, taking away their rights to land, property, and employment. Number three, their concentration in facilities such as prisons where their voting rights are stripped, labor is exploited, families are broken apart. Number four, their annihilation either indirectly by taking away health care and food or directly through killing. Sound familiar? What relates to the artists in these stages is the first assault, which has to do with identification. This is the picture, the image of which we as artists have agency over. To identify something is to assign a meaning, to associate a mental picture and an emotional response or reaction to that picture. What feelings are conjured with the image of black? Black male, black female. What is the feeling conjured with white? white male, white female. What feelings are conjured by immigrant, Muslim, and so on? These are identifiers, social constructions for the purpose of separation. This is not the grid, and this is not love. Edward Glissant writes in The Poetics of Relation, either the other is assimilated 
or else annihilated. Today, it is not only the legitimacy of cultures that is threatened in the world, also threatened are their reactions to equivalency." End quote. So we need a worldview, a good gestalt, in this era of I, iPad, and iMac, and iPhone, and AI, can non-representational abstraction be the stand-in for anonymous humanity and respond to the universal call for a singular plurality, a global call for yes, we can. Yes, we can. The grid and abstraction allows for multiple non-hierarchical access points into visual representation and interpretation. This is the latitudinal perception of humanity. This is an expansive view and an infinite one. This is the idea of mutualism. Longitudinal would imply vertical and linear connections where there is dominance and subordinate levels, whereas a latitudinal would imply flatness and equality while maintaining difference. Abstract thinking changes the view of objectification. With abstraction, objectification is not the reduction of a person to an object or to dehumanize them, but rather it is the non-subjugation to prejudice or false attributes and histories. Simply put, it is what it is and who it is at the core of the being where we are all the same. So this is a truth in this realm of data identities, spin and fake news. The grid is a revelation of a truth and the sacred. There are more truths unseen than seen. This is beyond the political. There are no isms here. Racism, sexism, nationalism, all is one. Abstraction is beauty, and beauty is the revelation of the sacred. The sacred is beautiful, ineffable, and the unknown made, no made known through experience. Paul Clay writes, art does not reproduce the visible, but makes visible, end quote. For me, abstraction is based on the formal gesture with sincere impetus and is not a direct result of the ethnicity of its author. Abstraction is meaningful, but has no meaning. It is a profound moment and is profound in the moment, an initial wordless experience. Abstraction is the moment, the moment of rest, where the knowable is rendered unknowable. The thing is now no thing, nothing. Where there is pure subjectivity, there is infinite objectivity, the possibility for all possibilities. This is abstraction, giving things a chance. Let's see what happens. What happens when we remove representation, labels, and titles, or even names? For just a moment, what happens when we remove convention and identities and simultaneously integrate underlying parts that on the surface seem desperate? This is abstract thinking, bridging the gap between the surface and what lies beneath. Non-representational abstraction can have subject and content, even though physically it can be composed of color and form and surface only. In my case, the subject is the grid, a metaphor for humanity, and the inspiration is the public square. The city square or public square is the nexus of humanity. Paul Zucker writes in The Town and Square, it creates a gathering place that humanizes people by mutual contact providing a shelter against the haphazard traffic and freeing people from the tension on rushing through the web of streets, end quote. I use this site as a global framework to propose unity amid a divided socio-political climate. Historically, they were called agoras, which is Greek, and served as the heart of the city and the intersection of human interaction. In ancient Greek society, it was the site for political discourse, worship, 
athletic challenge, commercial exchange, business, and freedom of speech. The word agora, at its root, means to speak in the assembly. This assembly served as the setting for democracy, which literally means power to the people. I believe true freedom of speech occurs in a non-local environment. In other words, speaking among others who don't look like you, think like you, be like you. In this sense, one is at large. In this setting, the possibilities of unity and democracy can be globally addressed and create a place where the displaced can find a place. Abstract thinking in practice is democracy at its best. To think abstractly is to see your neighbor as yourself. Abstract thinking states that one sees the child from Central America the same as the one from the center of America. Where would democracy be without the marginalized who launched words and held signs with letters as shields against the attacks of racism and sexism? Their charge was to uphold the ideal of democracy that America acts as a lie. They, we, hold liberty to her word and ask that she acts accordingly. Where would democracy be without the urgent request of the African-American, the immigrant, the woman, and those who seek the marriage of their choosing? There is no mainstream, but we all paddle together downstream, past the swamps and marshes and beaches toward the same gulf of equality. The pursuit of happiness, fairness, and equality are human rights. True civilized manners down to yes ma'am and no ma'am are cultural cues of respect in the South, but also are suggestions of an armament that guns down bigotry and isms of disrespect and oppression with R-E-S-P-E-C-T, find out what it means to me. Stand down and be trodden under hooves of hate, but take a stand and speak in the assembly in hopes of echoes of action and unity. Uplift those who hold you down, for they most of all are in dire need of assistance to see their way out of the darkness. Be abstract-minded and see your fellow being as you see yourself. Decorated skin is only a camouflage that clothes blood and heart and mind and feelings and care and emotions and hopes and dreams just as you. When a black man kills a black man, we should all say, we are killing ourselves. When a white man kills a black man, we should all say, we are killing ourselves. When a woman is raped, we should all say, we are hurting ourselves. When an immigrant is indefinitely detained, we should all say, we are mistreating ourselves. In math, to reduce a fraction to its essential state, the least common denominator is used. But the greatest common denominator is to think and feel, for it is the essential nature of humanity and the greatest good, which is love.
sometimes things happen in the studio that is a WTF moment. And it's talking to you out in the corner of the studio. And if you are sensitive enough, you listen. So these are strips of paper and plastic and canvas that have been discarded and they seem to gravitate toward themselves in the studio and I paid attention. I didn't know quite what I wanted to do with it, but intuitively I felt that it was resonating with me. So I hung it, I put it on the wall. I knew it wasn't a finished piece, but at the same time, it was talking to me. So at this particular juncture in my creating process, the things that were used to create the painting became the painting, but then the painting became a means to an end. And so I started doing collagraphs. So this is a direct result of this. It's the same matter, just inked and trans, the topography of it is transferred onto paper. And so began this series. These are the same component parts being rearranged. So I'm thinking about this as just matter and how we all have the same DNA, the same deoxyribose nucleic acid, but it being rearranged infinitely number of times gets, gives us all our own individuality, but yet we're all still connected. This began another juncture. This is San Marco Square in Venice. And this just really, really resonated with me in terms of this idea of with and how the idea of with was then enriched by the repetition of form as you see in the columns on either side of the square. And so this is a public square or a city square. It's the type known as a, as a closed square. There are different types. And so for me to understand this and metabolize it, I made this piece. This is Agora 1. And so for me, this was about walking along a painting as opposed to standing in front and trying to encompass the whole thing at one time. The same as walking along the width of the square. This began the series of flattening of economies or hierarchies by putting printmaking and drawing and painting all on the same surface.
this was my trip to Athens. I think that was March, February, March, um, supported by the ARC Athens residency program. Uh, I was one of the inaugural residents, and here I am with my, um, one of my hosts, Iris, who's also an art historian, and we're in the Agora. Here was standing beside the stoa, which was the place of merchant exchange. And you can see the columns kind of enforcing this repetition of form that then enriches the idea of width. Although in ruins, you can still get a sense of the, the agora, the space. This is the floor plan. One of the things that I observed while in Athens was this idea of the grid that I saw <clears throat> on the sidewalks, as well as in the columns that were in the, uh, the antiquities. What I also saw was this use of cardboard, which the merchants put out at the end of the day and then the people who didn't have as much came in and grabbed the cardboard at night and either recycled it or they made these kind of tent houses that they slept in at night. So I took the cardboard and saw this kind of duality between the idea of the grid, the idea of antiquity, and the idea of recycled materials, the sense of humanity, and I used it. To make these. So th again, these are color graphs. So I'm inking the cardboard, just found cardboard, and then um, running, running paper over top of it. Again, this is the cardboard. The Mediterranean, oh. <laughs> it's 
So these are the influences, the color and that influenced me to make that piece. So I say, don't make art, make heart. Thank you.